Uh, well, I'm very excited to be at St. John's uh, for the first time. I was, um, I was going to sneak around uh, the site and, um, and, and, and have a nose in all, all the places I could manage. So it's great to know that we can, um, we're authorised to do that. Um, thank you, Sam and Tom. Um, I'm also quite daunted to be uh, leading off such a, an impressive um, lineup of uh, scholars and um, uh, a little worried to hear myself described as the linchpin when really I just thought I was the warm up act for today's uh, program. I'm also uh, quite surprised at the turnout for this um, first early session. Um, uh, do you all know that it's a direct clash with Kim Hill interviewing the musician Fatboy Slim and uh, <laughs> the Booker Prize winning author um, Colm Toybean? <laughs> um, I, I guess that's a plus of uh, podcasts these days, at least you can catch up on that later. Um, I uh, want to use um, as the jumping off point um, for my talk today uh, Ruth Ross's landmark 1972 uh, New Zealand Journal of History article, Te Tūruti O Waitangi Texts and Translations, arguably the, the most important piece of New Zealand historical writing that there's ever been. Ruth Ross's um, 1972 article is, is rightly regarded as path-breaking. She was right to focus on the Māori text, which had been neglected. She was right to say that the English text was merely a draft. She was right to interrogate and compare the words used in both texts. And she made the very important contribution to treaty scholarship of emphasising that the guarantee of Titino Rangatiratanga was a promise to preserve chiefly authority, which doesn't appear explicitly in the English text. But it's, it's my view that, that Ross was wrong in jumping to the conclusion that the guarantee of Titino Rangatiratanga was inconsistent with the cession of sovereignty and that thus that the treaty was contradictory and a deceit upon Māori. And as you know, this remains a persistent and perhaps even dominant view in our history. And uh, it's my view, and I know shared by others who are speaking today, that it requires correction. Ross's analysis principally turned on textual comparison. And again, uh, others who are speaking today share the view that a wider context than she drew on undermines the conclusion that the two texts are inconsistent. That text includes the, sorry, that context includes the backgrounds and the motivations of those who framed the treaty, the history of British dealings with indigenous peoples in other parts of uh, the empire and the currents of thought of the time. In part, reassessment of um, Ross's conclusions turns on the meaning of that word sovereignty in 1840, which is a matter that Sam is going to deal with. In part, it turns on the understanding of those who framed the treaty. And I suspect a few of our speakers are going to uh, discuss the part played by Henry Williams. I'm gonna touch on two of the others. James Stephen and James Busby, while concentrating on the colonial office and imperial experience. They indicate that the treaty belongs in a tradition which was comfortable with plurality in government and law so far as indigenous populations were concerned. British intervention in New Zealand in 1840 was to establish government over British settlers for the protection of Māori. Assimilation of Māori into settler society wasn't the goal. Māori tribal organisation and custom were to be maintained under British sovereignty. This view of the treaty was widely understood in 1840 and it wasn't eclipsed for many decades. Even if we can now see that the drift was against 
pluralism and away from the humanitarian concerns of the 1830s. The original understandings are seen in English back translations of the Treaty in Māori, which recognised the continuation of chiefly authority without provoking objections that such authority was incompatible with the cession of sovereignty in the published English text. It's also seen in the persistence of views by informed observers that sovereignty or kāwanatanga was limited by the specific purposes of British intervention. Now Ruth Ross points to the explanation in 1860 by the former Chief Justice Sir William Martin uh, that, who I guess was, was influential in, in, in the founding of this college, see? Uh, that what the English text called sovereignty was called kawanatanga or governorship in Māori. So Ross uh, pointed to him uh, uh, recognising that, but what she omitted from her article was Martin's immediate comment that the governorship obtained by the treaty was in some degree defined by a reference to its object of averting the evil consequences which must result from the absence of law. And Martin was there picking up on the preamble of the treaty. Martin explained that the powers necessary for the exercise of the new and unknown office of governor were powers unknown to the chiefs, while to themselves they retained what they understood full well, the Titino Rangatiratanga, the full chiefship in respect of all their lands. Martin said that since the treaty, these rights of the tribes and of the chiefs had been solemnly and repeatedly recognised by successive governors, not merely by words, but by acts. Martin's understanding was consistent with British imperial practice, which, as a policy preference, accommodated indigenous systems of government and law under British sovereignty. And this preference is seen in British North America under the Covenant Chain, which respected tribal autonomy, which was adopted in the 17th century and continued in Upper Canada into the 19th century. It's seen in West African treaties ceding sovereignty to Britain, which continued to recognise tribal authority and custom. So for example, an 1827 Gambian Treaty even acknowledged under British sovereignty a continuing entitlement to go to war. Similarly, on the eastern front of the Cape Colony, treaties in 1835 and 1836 with the Sosa tribes preserved their laws and internal government with stated exceptions. And really the Australian and Canadian maritime colonies were exceptional in having no explicit recognition of indigenous policies. Uh, although neither was there really any real attempt to impose British government on them. There was no established practice that by reason of British territorial sovereignty, indigenous populations were subject to English law it was rare for colonial law to be applied to crimes between natives. It happened only where crimes were malum in se, evil in itself, committed in an area of British settlement, or where the exercise of British authority was accepted by the tribe to which the perpetrator belonged. And even these cases were controversial. European impact on indigenous societies around the globe was a hot topic in London in the mid to late 1830s, discussed in books, pamphlets, and parliamentary reports. As uh, I'm sure all of you know, the harm caused to native populations by colonization was the subject of an 1837 report by the House of Commons Select Committee on Aborigines and British Settlements. 
it advocated reliance on missionary efforts to civilise native populations, with the role of government being to support that endeavour while ensuring that native rights were respected and protected by law. The example of Indian self-government provided by the Credit River Mississauga Reserve, established in 1826, was seen as a model for Aboriginal advancement in the Select Committee's report. Um, now, uh, the Credit River Mississauga Reserve was also referred to in an 1838 pamphlet on New Zealand written by the Reverend Edward Marsh, who was Henry Williams's brother-in-law. The Credit River Band had adopted a constitution recognised by the Indian Department based on our ancient customs, which asserted the nationhood of the band and produced its own laws to regulate such matters as family rights, criminal responsibility, use of the shared resources of the band, immigration, public welfare, uh, and the ratification of the treaties. So that constitution in, in Canada was, was recognised by the Indian Department, and this was all occurring on a reserve uh, only about, I think, 10 miles from Tor Toronto. This interest in the treatment of native societies coincided with developing anxiety about the position in New Zealand. Concerns about lawless Europeans, activities of Australian land sharks uh, and British proposals for organised settlement, especially that of the New Zealand Company, forced the Colonial Office in 1839 to intervene. No one contributed more to the settling of the terms on which Britain intervened than James Stephen, <coughs> the permanent Under Secretary of State for the Colonies, the civil servant who headed the Colonial Office. He had unparalleled experience uh, of the administration of empire. The existence in New Zealand of a substantial indigenous population under pressure from European encroachment presented uh, in a new setting what to Stephen was a familiar problem and one he regarded with particular anxiety. Stephen had been brought up in an anti-slavery family in Circle. His father had remarried William Wilberforce's sister um, and was a member with Wilberforce of the so-called Clapham sect. Uh, indeed, it is said that the younger Stephen joined the colonial office because he wished to play a part in the ending of slavery. He wrote the law that ended slavery in the British Empire. Stephen also had close connections with the Church Missionary Society. Uh, his, one of his brothers was on the committee. Uh, Stephen recognised that native populations possessed political and property rights, which were to be respected and which could only be changed with their agreement. He had a profound fear of the damage that could be caused if native societies were brought prematurely into contact with Europeans or even Christianized ex-slave populations. He did not accept that Europeans had a right or a duty to impose their culture on unwilling population, native populations. He was skeptical about the role of government in civilization, while it might play its part through such measures as anti-slavery treaties and encouragement of commerce, Stephen preferred uh, to leave this work to missionaries, and ideally native missionaries. Uh, given Stephen's views and the persistent reports of the impact on Māori of uncontrolled European activities, it's not surprising that the colonial officer's priority was to obtain authority over the European population in New Zealand. The historical record is clear that the British government intervened in New Zealand in 1840 
to establish government over British subjects for the protection of Māori, as seen in, for example, the preamble of the English draft of the treaty, Norman B's instructions to Hobson, earlier drafts of those instructions in January and February 1839, colonial office letters to the law officers and treasury, a treasury minute that was tabled in Parliament, instructions to Governor George Gipps of New South Wales, to whom Hobson was initially subordinate, Gipps' own directions to his subordinates, and the proclamations that Hobson read out at Kororarika on 30 January 1840. Time and again, the phrase that appears is that Hobson was sent to New Zealand to establish a settled form of civil government over British subjects in New Zealand. Um, and we're going to hear later from Sam about how the treaty can be read through the lens of civil government. There is also no doubt that the policy of intervention was re reached reluctantly and with the feeling that it was the lesser evil uh, than unregulated settlement. But by December 1837, it was recognised that it was impossible to leave matters on the preferred basis of keeping Māori from European contact until, by the influence of Christian missions, they were ready for it. Irregular colonisation was underway, and by January 1839, the only question was between acquiescence in a lawless colonisation and the establishment of a colony placed under the authority of law. The instructions given to Hobson by the colonial office, uh, sorry, by the colonial secretary, Lord Normanby, continued the view contained in earlier drafts of the instructions that British intervention was essentially unjust and fraught with risk to Māori. But by then, the, in the necessity for the interposition of the government has become too evident to admit of any further inaction. These repeated expressions of reluctance overcome uh, by the necessity to protect Māori make it clear that British priority was for Māori and that intervention was not seen, as some have argued, as equally a duty owed to British settlers. Rather, British purpose was, as Norman B's predecessor, Lord Glenelg, told Parliament in March 1838, to protect the natives of the country and the British settlers consistently with the interests of the natives. It's worth noting that the colonial office didn't entertain a particularly high opinion of most British settlers in New Zealand. Uh, in an early draft of Hobson's instructions, they were said to be, for the most part, people of disorderly habits and profligate character who were likely, if unchecked, to exterminate Māori and to become the nucleus of piratical adventurers, dangerous to the commerce of all nations in the Southern Hemisphere. Although the final instructions recognised that settlers themselves would benefit from civil government and that Britain's own wealth and uh, national wealth and power would be boosted by annexation because New Zealand offered such good prospects uh, for colonisation, it's clear these ends could be promoted because they were believed to be reconcilable with the overwhelming object of protecting Māori. And in my view, this belief has to be seen in the context of what was then expected. It's most unlikely that it was envisaged that the European population would reach even the 30,000 it attained by 1852 or that a form of responsible government would devolve upon the settlers by that time. In 1840, New Zealand was expected to be a colony of a few maritime settlements focused on whaling, timber, and some agricultural, but um, significantly not pastoral farming. And that's because no one thought that New Zealand would be able to compete with the Australian colonies in terms of pastoral 
farming. The Crown's monopoly on purchase of Māori land would ensure that European settlement didn't adversely impact on Māori, since only land surplus to Māori needs would be purchased and European settlements would be apart from the lands occupied by Māori. What then was the sovereignty or kāwanatanga ceded? Kāwanatanga was the new authority created by the chiefs through the act of confederation of those who signed the Declaration of Independence in 1835. And Sam uh, ha has argued this, this brilliantly in, in, in reports for the Waitangi Tribunal. As William Martin was to say about the Kawanatanga ceded in the treaty, this was a power that was unknown and unnecessary in traditional Māori society, but for which there was a felt need in the new world of the early 19th century. Under the declaration, the chiefs in their collective capacity were to have legislative authority to make laws for the dispensation of justice, the preservation of peace and good order, and the regulation of trade. And all functions of government, uh, which was rendered as Tatahi Kawanatanga in the Māori text of the Declaration. The collective governmental powers of the Confederation of United Tribes were distinct from each tribe's control of its internal affairs, which they retained. James Busby, who proposed the Declaration and later, of course, contributed to the treaty text, described the object of the Declaration as being to distinguish and elevate the character of each chief amongst his own people. As he observed, the chief's request in the Declaration for William IV's protection was lest their chieftainship should be destroyed. Kawanatanga was not seen, therefore, as inconsistent with the retention of chiefly authority. And Busby also knew very well what rangatiratanga meant. When appearing in front of a legislative, uh, the Legislative Council of New South Wales in July 1840, so only a few months after the treaty was signed, Busby said that the closest word for independence in Māori was rangatiratanga. Clearly, he didn't see the guarantee of rangatiratanga in the treaty as clashing with the cession of sovereignty or kāwanatanga. Perhaps the most compelling evidence that the treaty was understood to leave undiminished um, inter-tribal government except in matters of law and order for which sovereignty had been ceded, is found in the explanations given at the treaty signings or recorded in the accounts left by witnesses. Hobson reported that he had assured the chiefs that their standing among their tribes would not be affected by British sovereignty. That uh, assurance is confirmed by the Catholic missionary Father Louis Catherine's servants report that the treaty involved the chiefs giving Hobson authority to maintain good order and protect their respective interests while preserving to them their powers. Major Thomas Bunbury sent around New Zealand an HMS Herald to gather signatures to the treaty, told the Ngāti Kahanunu chief Te Hapuku at Hawke's Bay that the power obtained by the Queen was only to enforce the execution of justice and good government equally amongst her subjects and that it was not the object of Her Majesty's government to lower the chiefs in the estimation of their tribes. Felton Matthew, the Surveyor General, writing of the treaty signing at Waitangi, uh, said that the chiefs, in agreeing to cede the sovereignty of the country and throwing themselves on the protection of the Queen, had nevertheless retained full power over their own people, remaining perfectly independent. He also commented on the stipulations the chiefs had made for the preservation of their liberty and perfect independence, 
and express the expectation that if, if Māori didn't disappear as a result of colonisation, they might, in after centuries, become as enlightened and powerful a nation as we are ourselves. Even the New Zealand Company's uh, mouthpiece, the New Zealand Gazette, regarded the treaty as a union or a confederation between a civilised and a savage state by treaty. Because of continuing anxiety among Māori about the protection of custom, Hobson's circular letter of 27 April 1840 promised Māori that the governor will ever strive to assure unto you the customs belonging to the Māori. Similar assurance was given by his deputy Willoughby shortly at Kaitaia. He told the chiefs that Hobson had been sent to protect them from lawless white men and that the Queen would not interfere with their native laws nor customs. So all of this suggests that the implications of the English text were understood in the same sense as the division between Kawanatanga and Rangateratanga in the Māori text. On this view, Rangateratanga refers to independence in internal affairs, leaving Kawanatanga or sovereignty defined and limited as William Martin maintained by reference to its objects as applying to foreign relations, peace and good order, particularly in relation to the suppression of war warfare and trade. In the colonial office, James Stephen did not treat plurality in government and law as inconsistent with British sovereignty in New Zealand. That's clear from the instructions he drew up for Norman B and for his successor, Lord John Russell. Russell's instructions were consistent with the retention by Māori tribes of their laws and institutions not consistent with British sovereignty. In Russell's instructions, Hobson was directed to maintain, establish and maintain friendly relations with the tribes now to be connected with us, language more indicative of alliance than of subjection. Subsequent dispatches from the colonial office confirmed the policy of acceptance of Māori custom. Lord Stanley made clear to acting Governor Shortland in June 1843, there is no apparent reason why the Aborigines should not be exempted from any responsibility to English law or English courts of justice as far as respects their relations and dealings with each other. Uh, Stephen, in December 1843, expressed impatience at the legal pedantry that subjection to British sovereignty and subjection to English law are convertible terms. In matters purely inter se, between themselves, including the definition and punishment of crimes, he considered Māori should be free to live under their own law, as was the case in Ceylon, India and Canada. In this paper, I've only considered the meaning of the English text to its British framers, which, as we know, is only one uh, small part of the treaty story. And Ngāti Kawa is, is going to give us uh, soon uh, Ngāpui's perspective on Kawanatanga and Rangateratanga, and, 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 and that may change everything. <laughs> uh, how, however, for now, um, my conclusion is that once the text of the treaty is put in the wider context of the backgrounds and the motivations of the framers, the history of British dealings with other indigenous peoples, and the currents of thought of the time, there's no inconsistency between the Māori and the English versions as Ruth Ross thought. Thank you.